Imagine that you had a row of eight LEDs that were all lit up. If you moved them with a quick swipe to our eyes, it would appear as a blur until the movement stopped, like you just saw in the video. This effect is called persistence of vision, and it is an optical illusion. Here we can see the swipe motion one more time. But what do you suppose would show up if we controlled each LED individually? Well, instead of a blur, we could actually show a picture or even spell out a message like this. This persistence of vision effect of displaying a message shows up best when the LED column changes every 5 microseconds or 200 hertz, and when swiped in front of a camera, and that is exactly what we intend to design in this lesson. So first we'll need to make the Cordis 2 project. We'll use the new project wizard. Let's save the project on the desktop in the FPGA slash Lesson 9 directory and then name the project Lesson 9. We'll use the EPM 3032 ATC 44-10 CPLD device, then click Next, Next, and finish the project creation. Now we'll need to add a new VHDL file to the project and we're ready to start coding. First we'll be using the IEEE library, specifically the standard logic and unsigned standard logic libraries. The port for the Lesson 9 entity will have a reset input, clock input, and 8 LED outputs in a standard logic vector. And that's the end of the entity declaration. We'll name our architecture RTL, and inside of this architecture, the first thing we'll need to have is a memory or ROM holding each unique output state for the LEDs. To build a ROM, we'll use an array of 32 standard logic vectors called type num array. Then the actual ROM itself will be called LED message. To initialize the ROM, you have to go through each of the 32 arrays and define the 8 bits. We use 1s and zeros to define when the LEDs will be on and off, and if you tilt your head, the comments after each array definition show you what letter should appear in the LED message. Before we can begin the architecture, we need to add another 8-bit standard logic vector called LED output and a clock divided by 2 signal. Now we begin the architecture. We start by making a process that is a simple clock divided by 2 output. We need this clock divider because our input clock frequency will be around 400 to 500 hertz, or double the required 200 hertz frequency our system actually needs. The second process in this architecture is a counter. Notice that the counter is using the reset and clock divide by 2 in its sensitivity list. Again, this is because we want to use the slow 200Hz signal that we just created in the first process as our main clock in the counter. Before we begin the process, we'll add a variable integer called letter count, and then we start to define the process. If reset is 1, then letter count should be 0, and LED output should also be 0. Otherwise, Else if the clock divided by 2 signal is a rising edge, if the letter count is less than 30, increment it. Otherwise, reset the letter counter to 0. LED output should always correlate to an LED message array element depending upon the current value of letter count. Then we end the if statement and the process, define that LED should be driven by the standard logic vector LED output, and then end the RTL architecture. Go ahead and save the project as Lesson9.vhd, then start the compilation process. Apparently, I'm still not a perfect coder, and I do make mistakes. Here you can see the compilers complaining that I used blank spaces as part of the standard logic definition. With a double click of the red error message, it highlights the line where the problem is, and yes, I put blank spaces instead of zeros. So let's fix that and recompile the project. This time, things compile smoothly. Let's open the pin planner and define all the input and output pins to the CPLD. Then we'll recompile the project once more, and now our CPLD project is finished. We just need to build a hardware schematic to go with it. The schematic for this project uses a power regulator circuit that has a 9 volt battery input into an LM317 voltage regulator, Two resistors connect to the LM317 to set its output voltage to 3.3 volts. Then two 10 microfarad capacitors are used as bypass capacitors on the input and output of the LM317. If you have the extra resistor and extra LED, 
It's always helpful to add a power good notification LED. The CPLD connections have all the VCC pins connecting to VCC power and all of the GND ground pins connecting to circuit ground. The reset at pin 44 is pulled to ground using a 10 kilo ohm resistor. Then we go through from pin 13 to 22, adding a resistor and LED in series to ground. This gives us our eight LED outputs. The clock generation circuit is an ICM7555 timer module. Pins four and eight connect to 3.3 volt power and pin one to circuit ground. The clock output comes from pin three and goes to the CPLD's global clock input at pin 37. Lastly, we use two 10 kilo ohm resistors in series along with two 0.1 microfarad capacitors in parallel connecting from 3.3 volt power to ground. Pins six and seven of the ICM7555 timer connect to in between the resistors and capacitors to set the output clock frequency. And that completes the hardware schematic. Now let's get building. Here are all the parts we'll be using in this experiment. The larger parts are a jumper wire kit, components kit, and a breadboard. The smaller parts from the components kit are a CPLD breakout board, LM317 voltage regulator, ICM7555 timer, two 10 microfarad capacitors, two 0.1 microfarad capacitors, eight 470 ohm resistors, a 240 ohm resistor, a 390 ohm resistor, three 10 kilo ohm resistors, eight red LEDs, and a nine volt battery connector. Now we'll build up the circuit part by part in a slow time lapse so that you can build the circuit with us. First, we'll build the power regulator circuit on the right side of the board, the CPLD connections on the left side of the board, and the clock generation circuit will be in the middle. With the circuit completely built, power it up, connect the JTAG programmer to the CPLD board and also to your laptop computer, then open up Lesson 9 in Cordis 2. Use the programmer tool inside of Cordis 2 to load the .pof file and then program the CPLD. Immediately, the LEDs will begin to blink in a constant yet odd pattern. If we clear off the table and dim the lights a little bit, you'll notice that when we swipe it back and forth, you can see some letters appear. This is the effect that we're after, and it's even more pronounced if you use a still camera and take photos of a swipe movement right in front of the camera. Here you can see some of our own photo captures, along with a few where we change the message. When you get this working, feel free to change the message to whatever you like. Another thing to note is that if you change the clock input frequency to the CPLD, the message letters will actually appear closer or further apart. Homemade POVs, whether they're handheld or spinning like this one, are exceptionally fun to play with as well as to design. They are a testament to how well we can control timing using digital devices. In the real world, you might not realize it, but electronics like your television, computer monitor, or even theater cameras constantly use the persistence of vision effect 
in the form of frames or refreshes per second. All parts in this online course were provided by the Gadgetory. Visit them at gadgetory.com slash pyroedu. After having so much fun in the last two lessons, let's expand our horizons and explore other ways of building a CPLD image by taking a look and comparing three different methods, schematic capture, Verilog, and VHDL.